What is up, YouTubers? <laughs> On today's episode of Shit I Shouldn't Be Buying, a Miller Dial Art 250 ACDC machine, old school. So that's what we're going to talk about today is this beast right here. Let's get into it. So I'm a sucker for old welding machines. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. I've owned a number of big machines kind of like this. I've never actually owned the Dial Art 250, but I have owned numerous Lincoln Ideal Art 250s and similar. And I thought, well, let's see what the marketplace has in store for me today. And long story short, I managed to come up with this for sub $300 American pesos, which is a pretty good deal especially because that's in the ballpark of what a lot of you guys have uh, for a stick welder on a budget. Now, I wouldn't really call this an ideal budget machine. In case you can't tell, it literally takes up the whole frame on the camera and is bigger than you know almost my welding table and the bench it sits on, so quite a big beast. But long story short, I found this purchased it. Now, I was not able to test this machine before I purchased it, which is kind of like a big no-no, always test things, but this thing didn't have any apparent damage that I could see, like the side isn't kicked in, the top isn't dented, and I know that this came out of a, a school that's, I don't know, about an hour away from me, so it pretty much likely just sat up in a rack its whole life, so I'm not really too worried about it having any issues. And if it does, hey, I'll fix it. And if I can't fix it, then guess what? I'll scrap it out and turn it into a refrigerator or something. So I'm not really too worried about it. But I thought I would share this, well, because one, this is pretty cool. And two, a viewer of ours had mentioned something about like refurbishing a welder and how to do that. And I thought this would be a really good example of what to look for when buying old equipment. And we can kind of go in in the guts of this thing and see how it works. So the first thing we're going to do, or well, what I'm going to do is clean all of this filth. It's even complete with dead moths and God knows what else on the outside. So I'm going to start by scrubbing the outside with some Windex and paper towels to get this sucker clean. For comedic value, I put this titanium 225 on it to show you how massive this actually is. I mean, this is bigger than, a, I'd say, one and a half mini fridges for sure. And it weighs, I don't know, enough to give you a hernia. Um, luckily, the guy had a tractor to load this in my truck. And this welding bench is just high enough to slide this welder off from my pickup truck bed onto here. And I have a chain full hoist to lower this to the floor when we're done with this video. But I'm not joking, guys. These things are 300 to 400 pounds. Insanely heavy. Definitely not fun. Bring a friend. Bring two friends if you're trying to buy one of these and load it. You know, honestly, a tractor or some kind of crane is the best way. And that's why, well, it has a lifting hook on it. So you can do just that. All right, let's look at the front of this. So this is Miller's Dial Art 250 ACDC. This is a DC capable stick welder slash power source. They did make these that are AC only. They're pretty uncommon. And I would highly recommend against buying one of those because they're just not really useful like this guy is. Despite this being old, it's still actually pretty useful because of the DC output. Now, 
To weld with AC on this, you plug your leads, your ground, and your stinger into here. For DC output, you plug in right here. This has a dial and a simple knob to turn. The comp competing, competing product to this, the Ideal Arc 250, had a crank dial on it that was kind of a pain in the ass to use. This is much simpler, much easier much faster, I like that better. I'm not quite sure how it's using that to adjust amperage. When we tear into this thing a little bit, we'll be able to figure out something on that, hopefully. Now, despite this being called a 250, it's actually capable of more output. The 250 is what they call its rated output. So in this case, it's rated at 250 amps of output, 30% duty cycle, both AC and DC. That's a tremendous amount of power and compared to like a modern stick welder, well, most of our stick welders at home can't even output 250 amps with the ones that can probably can't do it at 30% duty cycle. Now it's capable on DC of 265 amps on AC 300. My guess is the reduction in power outage or power output on DC is due to the bridge rectifier this has to use to, to convert the AC to DC and the power handling of that is going to limit the actual output. Who knows, we're going to be looking at all that when we open it up. Now to adjust this, it's a little bit uh, archaic per se. So a modern welder, we're used to just turning a knob and whatever, zero to 200, it, it displays it and that's it. Well, this is a little bit more complex, but definitely not hard at all. We have four scales on this dial. The two black ones are for DC, the two white ones are for AC output, and then we have what I call a transmission, which right here is we're in first gear, now we're in second gear. All that does is change the output. So in first gear, it's 35 to 155 amps. In second gear, it's 90 to 265. Those are DC numbers. And I'll put it back here, and then you just read whatever chart you're on. So the outer ring is the high gear, the inner black ring is the low gear. So a real quick example, we're on DC output, this is 120. If we're in low gear, if we're in high gear, this would be 120. And this switch must be manipulating uh, what winding we're tapping off on the transformer in order to create the two scales. I'm not exactly sure why they have two separate outputs. My guess is it has to do with the voltage amperage curve of the transformer. And who knows, maybe this has two transformers in it. I'm not sure, but it basically to get ideal performance for multiple rod sizes, they had to set it up this way. Otherwise you would probably wind up with not enough voltage on your lower rod sizes. Who knows though? Now this does have an overload breaker. I can't imagine what you'd have to do to actually hit that with this. I mean, you'd be welding, you know, big, big rods and you know, I'm never gonna hit it. But speaking about output, to get this level of massive output, this thing isn't very efficient. So guess what, buddy? You're going to need a massive power supply. This will drain your electrical system faster than your ex-wife did your wallet. Trust me on that. Um, no, seriously, though, you need, I would say, at least a 75 amp breaker direct wire to this to get max output. So that's pretty astronomical. I mean, a lot of us in our home garage don't have that much power to begin with. And if we do, you probably can't run too much and max this out. But the good news is because this, well, for one, has two outputs. So running in low gear and running with a, say, a 50 amp breaker, we still can get useful welding out of this. Uh, realistically, on a 50 amp breaker, this might hit 160 amps of output, maybe 180 tops. And beyond that is just too inefficient to, to get more than that. But that's still within a useful welding range for us at home. So with that said, let's look at the back a little bit. And I wanna talk about hooking this thing up. So right off the bat, you can see that this industrial power cord here, the clamp that holds this flexible conduit, 
is uh, it's popped out. I don't think, yeah, it's not broken, it just popped out. I'm actually gonna rewire this and go to a different cable to give you an idea. So this was in a high school or something. This is number two cable. So absolute massive cable on this. And this is a single phase machine since I didn't mention that. Some of these are capable of running on three phase. This one is a single phase. It will run on uh, two, what is it? 240, 208, uh, four something. I can't remember, but I have single phase on my generator and most of you would be running this on single phase as well. Now, two gauge cable is appropriate to get max output. I'm gonna be running this, hopefully, we'll see if it works, on a 30 amp breaker. And on a 30, I'm gonna use a number six power cord on this, which number six is actually rated up to 50 amps, which that's the most that I would ever be pulling out of this anyways, to be honest with you. So that's kinda what we're gonna do is remove this and I will keep this because when I finally get a new shop, I will be uh, doing a permanent install of this machine. So I always have a, you know, zombie apocalypse rated welder laying around. And, but for right now, this isn't of much use because I can't put a end on here to plug in anything. But like I said, I will keep it. We're gonna start by opening this side because it says, well, remove side to connect power. So we're gonna replace the cord anyway. So this is the first place that we're gonna start. Now I've actually never opened one of these before. So we have internals. Now, one of the things I forgot to mention, and I probably should have at the beginning of this video, is that never plug in a welder like this that's been sitting around that you couldn't test first and just plug it in the wall and think it's okay. Always open the side cover and verify that there aren't any broken wires. And I'll show you some tests you can do that are real simple, but look at this. We have a main power wire that was in here just touching the case and not hooked to anything. Now, it looks like what happened here is, if you look here, this is supposed to hold this down right here and this little bolt broke. See that? So effectively, this was off of it, yep. And had I plugged it in, this was touching the case, what would have happened is it would have tripped the breaker immediately because it would have shorted your main power wire to ground. So that's not good. Now to get a replacement for this, I should be able just to find a brass stud and nut. Shouldn't be too hard to get. I'll figure that out later. But for the time being, we know that we have a broken stud. Now, I gotta reference this little chart down here under the schmoo. Whew, dusty. Um, this may actually be wired incorrectly for the voltage that I'm gonna be running it on. I'll have to figure that out, but in the off chance that it's wired wrong, I can just possibly wire it to here for 240 volt and we can still use it and not worry about the fact that's broke. Who knows, we'll figure it out. So we have identified that as being a potential issue. I'm gonna take a look around in here and see if we have any other degraded or broken wires. So if you see any, shout. All right, so I took a pretty good look around in here. I'm gonna end up opening up the other side's panel to get a better look at it. But as far as I can tell, I don't see any other broken wires. This unit appears to be a fairly new unit. I don't see an actual date. The side panel I pulled off here, let me show you. 
Normally, this right here will indicate a year. This one does not. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't something on the other side that indicates a year. It's possible. But let's open up the other side and look at it. So on this side, there really isn't a whole lot more to see. I thought there might have been some sort of a paperwork on this side panel that would tell us a little bit more about like manufacturer year and stuff, but there's nothing on it. So not a big deal. The amount of filth in here is what you would expect for something that likely was used a lot. I mean, just look at this. A lot of dust. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to vacuum out a lot of this to begin with. And then I'm going to use a leaf blower and blow it out the garage door to clean up the rest of it. But I don't see any melted wires or blown up wires. So that's all good. It just needs a good thorough, you know, dusting out on this. Now, the interesting thing is this knife switch up here that adjusts amperage ranges. It appears as though this is uh how do i put it it's using one or the other transformer the main transformer or it might be a secondary i'm not exactly sure i gotta really look at this but long story short it changes the amperage range by changing the transformer and both transformers look similar but their windings are likely different to get a different amperage and voltage curve out of them so that this thing can weld properly with smaller rods and bigger rods. Cause that's what you can run into and is why a lot of the home hobby machines won't weld with 6011 is because the way that their transformer is set up, uh, or excuse me, 6010, the transformer is set up to where it can't produce high enough voltage at lower amperage. So like 6010 needs 30 volts at like 90 amps. Well, a normal transformer that's built for stick welding, it, it's not really designed to output that high of voltage at that amperage. And if you don't have two transformers, so one that runs rods properly at higher amperage and one that runs at lower amperage, you're basically going to end up screwed to where you just can't run high uh, closed circuit voltage rods. Well, this thing got around that problem by having two separate transformers. So that's quite a a thought process there. Now, these back here, which I'm gonna zoom in. So this guy right up here, the same thing there with the wire coming out of it. And then there's two more on the other side that are in line with this uh, fan. Those are one-way diodes that are part of a bridge rectifier that create the DC output. So on these old clunkers, if you ever lose your DC output where you start getting AC or it just doesn't work, but the AC works, these uh, diodes are probably bad and they're really easy to replace and even fairly economical. And that's really one of the things that makes this a DC capable power source are these things, the four of those. That's a little bit better with this light. I didn't realize a camera could do a decent video without this bright ass Milwaukee light. So this guy right here appears to be a inductor or what Miller would call a reactor. So all this is, is a very thick solid copper wire that's wrapped around in a coil that goes directly to the output. So off of the bridge rectifier that creates DC uh, off of the AC signal, that DC then goes through this, which helps clean up the, well, it doesn't perfectly, but when you convert AC to DC with just a simple bridge rectifier, which is basically a bunch of one-way diodes, one-way gates, you wind up with really choppy AC not really AC, really choppy DC output, thank you. And by putting it through a large coil of wire like this, it helps reduce the peaks of voltage and the lows of the voltage and kind of normalizes it a little bit. 
So a quick little book learning session here on bridge rectifiers. I realized that I was talking about them and you may not understand what I'm talking about. And a bridge rectifier is really a very simple setup, at least in this particular welder. It's a series of diodes that will only allow power or voltage to go through in one direction. And what I mean by that is a normal AC wave that's coming out of your wall and that's inside of this welder is both positive 120 and negative 120 because this is 240 volts. Where we get the 240 volts is a potential difference between the two is 240, okay? But it's positive 120, negative 120. What a bridge rectifier does in simple terms is it allows power through like this and it flips this upside down on an one output wire to where rather than having the voltage here, it eliminates all of it and then creates it on the positive side. Now, if you look here, this would be higher than 120 volts because 120 is the average, the root mean square of it. So let's say 160 volts, okay, is the absolute peak. Right here is 160, and but the average over time is far less than that. Well, as you can see, you'd have a voltage that goes from 0 to 160 to 0 to 160. You might have a 120 volt average, but to weld with this, this is kind of a shitty waveform for DC output. Yes, it is DC because it's only on the positive side and it is not alternating positive and negative, okay? But this would give uh, a pretty rough arc. So we need to smooth it out, okay? How that's achieved is with that big inductor on the side of the machine, or in welder's terms, Miller calls it a reactor. It's basically a giant choke, or it adds, it, it, how do I put it? It's a big coil of thick copper wire, and when large amounts of voltage or current pass through it, it has a tendency to act in a way like a capacitor where as the electrons flow through it, it wants to keep everything moving. So it resists change in voltage would be the best way it could describe it. So what ends up happening is that reactor, as the voltage creeps up, it's resisting that. And I'll, I'll show you in the red we'll use. So straight out of that bridge rectifier, it's resisting it. So the voltage ends up doing more like this. Now the peak voltage out of that's going to be lower, but the lowest voltage will be higher than what it is without it. So essentially the waveform is more like this rather than this. And this is far smoother for welding purposes, and that's why they have that in there. You can achieve the same thing to a certain extent with capacitors, but you have to understand that this machine, capacitors are great for things like this. However, this machine was designed to get a lot of years out, and capacitors over time can go bad, uh, and they would likely have far less of a lifespan than a simple transformer and a giant choke like the machine has. So for reliability, it makes total sense as to why they did it the way they did. And this is very similar to like what the Lincoln Ideal Arc 250. It functions the same way uh, to create more of a smooth DC output versus this. And in part two, we're actually going to look on an oscilloscope to where we can actually see exactly what is going on inside of the machine to where we can see all these components actually doing this. But I wanted to give you a brief overview of what's trying to be achieved. All right, let's get back to the video.
So it gives it a smoother output. And that's what this giant copper coil is used for. And that just goes straight to the output on that. This right here, which thought that was copper, huh? I don't even know, if it's aluminum. Huh, that is aluminum. So that goes also from the bridge rectifier output and yeah, okay. So yeah, these are the two outputs when you're running on DC. And then it has the inductor, the giant inductor on one side of it. Now you have two transformers up here. These two appear to be fairly identical other than the windings are a little bit different on the secondary, but all this is, and I'll put a diagram of it up, it appears that they're just two separate transformers and what happens is, is this knife switch over here controls which one you're running on. At least that's what it looks like to me. Now consult the wiring diagram, but this is a really simple setup. Not really a whole lot that can go wrong with this. Very heavy though, very gigantic. Pretty interesting. All right, let's go back to the other side. So here is the wiring diagram. It seems to be pretty simple. And again, I'm no electrical engineer. So all of this over here is indicating wiring based on different voltages. But depending on what your voltage is, it enters in a different point of the transformer. And then this here, which is a primary transfer, transformer, carries over to these. By the look of it, so you have a rectifier here, and this also appears to be a rectifier. This appears to be the one on the back by the fan. And sure enough, the low and high switch that's depicted here is just utilizing uh, different parts of the transformer, and that's up top here. So it's just using basically these two, or if you're on high, it uses these two. So it is indeed a double transformer machine. So that's pretty ingenious the way that they wired this. Now, one thing I'm not exactly clear on is how this actually adjusts amperage. And let me show you. So when you look at this rotary switch, you can see it has a little wiper on there and depending on where that contactor rubs up against this dial, dictates amperage output. Now it appears to only touch at most three, if not two, yeah, it appears to be three at least of these right here. So obviously it's working on some form of resistance and it's uh, simple like a variac or, oh Christ, I can't remember what those are called. But anyways, if you know, put it in the comments. So it's a very simple setup for that, but I don't understand how that can interface with a transformer in order to change output in a variable state because transformers have a winding ratio. So I'm not quite sure how that is utilized to control amperage output. If you have an idea on that, write it in the comments. All right, since I got this sucker open right now, I thought I would go through and do some simple tests that you guys can do if you're looking at buying one of these or if you inherited one. And like I said, it's smart not to just plug it in a wall and see if it blows up. It's better if you actually check some things first. So I have a simple voltage tester now. We're not gonna be using it for voltage right now. We're gonna be using it for uh, continuity testing. So I have it set to where it makes an audible beep when I connect these two wires together, okay? The purpose of that is we're gonna be looking to make sure that this wire is actually connected down below at where the power end comes in. Now, again, we're gonna be switching over this whole cord system, so that's really not a concern, but it is if you're just buying one of these and wanna use it with the cord that's on there. So, <clears throat> This stuff is almost inflexible. So we'll just sit here, and again, don't have it plugged into the wall when you're screwing around with this, okay? Don't be an idiot. So I got our cable ends. What I'm gonna do 
is hold this right here. And I'm gonna check. So this wire right here goes to this guy right here. And we do not have continuity over here, which is a good sign because that means these two wires as they come out to your plug-in that goes in the wall, that they're not shorted together. So now I'm gonna check, again, no continuity. So essentially I have no continuity between these wires. And then this wire right here is hooked up to there, so that's a good sign. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check the ground cable, which is right here. I'm gonna hold that on there, and I'm gonna come down where the ground cable comes in. Good. So I know that the ground cable's hooked up. Now had I had an actual plug-in, plug end on this, I would just be checking the terminals on it. You don't want continuity between these two points at all. Now this is disconnected, so that's, you would have to have it disconnected. So no continuity, that's fine. And you do not want continuity between this and the ground. So I'm holding it on the ground down here. Neither one of these wires and where this was hooked up under any circumstance should have continuity to the ground. And that's the most important thing. And what I generally recommend for people is on your power plug end, go between both the hot wires and then put, so go from a hot wire on the plug like this and then go to the case itself of the welder. If you have continuity, like I'll just simulate it. So I'm holding it on the case ground and then I come up and I touch one of the power inputs and it's grounded out through the case. The second you plug that welder on, it's gonna trip your breaker, arc, spark, whatever. You have a wire that's shorted to ground. Now the most common culprit, if you have continuity between a ground wire and power wire is for this wires where they come in here let me adjust that there. Now you can see better, sorry about that. One of these wires is probably shorted out where it comes into the case and it's shorted out onto the case and that's why you have continuity. You never want continuity between a hot wire, which is one of these in the ground of the machine or the ground of the wire. Okay, and like I said, it always pays to open them up and just look at the condition of the cables. Now these, look in really good shape. I don't see any nicks or any problems. This does have the proper plastic bushing here, which is good. So that won't be shorted out. We will be replacing this cable in here. So what I'm gonna do now, since I'm in here, is I'm gonna take off this and we're gonna end up pulling all of this off so I can rewire it. So this little thing here is all, this one and this one are the only things that transmit that 70 amps of input AC into the main transformer here. That's kind of ridiculous because, so this thing broke off, but what's to say it wasn't that it was getting hot over time. You know what I'm saying? And it, and it fatigued this from the heat stress. I'm sure these are probably available somewhere. I'm going to have to come up with a solution. And the solution may be, since this is just an isolation board, and I think maybe what I'll do is find a little bit bigger of a terminal than this. Although the wiring, eh, I don't know. I'll have to come up with a solution for this because I'm sure it's gonna be at least a four day wait through Miller to get something like this. So this guy right here is basically what your varying input voltages go into and then the output of this feeds the transformer up here, which is your welding transformers. There's two of them. And this, as far as I can tell, is only 
used to get the output voltage regardless of input voltage to the correct amount to where the welding transformer works properly. The thought process of how this really works is something that doesn't really exist anymore in the welding world thanks to technology. Like we don't need to rely on such big massive transformers just for the sake of trying to convert power to something that another transformer can use. Because you guys got to remember, every one of these transformers has a different, um, how do I put it, different efficiency and, and it causes a loss in the system. And having all of these is just, you know, there's a lot of losses involved in this. And modern welders are far more efficient than this. And in the next video, because I can't get this working today, we'll actually look at the efficiency of this and compare it to a more modern welder. And I think you guys will be shocked at the difference. So as expected, I could not find this identical brass terminal. So I'm going to end up modifying this slightly. I found this battery terminal it's sold as a battery terminal. Kind of an odd little thing here. And what I'm going to do is it works just like the one that was on here. So I'm going to bolt it up here, just like this. And then I use a jumper wire to go from the back to the front, or front to the back, depending on how you look at it. Now, let me show you something I find pretty odd. So this is a cable that was feeding the input of this machine, two gauge, massive cable, right? And I get it, like when you're pulling 80, 90 amps, you might need a cable this big to meet the duty cycle rating and NEC of this wire, blah, blah, blah. But all of the power that comes through this big fat cable, right, gets transmitted through this little, it's not even quarter inch bolt, brass bolt. So this passes through that plastic terminal block and essentially this is the only thing that transmits power into this unit. And I see stuff like this all the time and it honestly just makes me scratch my head as to what somebody was thinking because it's like, okay, you got this big aluminum terminal block and on this big fat wire and, and then you look at this. And how many amps is this really going to take at 240 volt? I don't know. I, I doubt less than 90. And that's probably what happened with the other one where it broke off. It probably got hot and fatigued over time from the current draw and then failed. Which is why the setup that I have now where I'm using a stud still just to make it easier to uh, hook up wiring to this. But... The power wire is going to come in hooked to here, but it has this big six gauge jumper, which clearly will handle more power, more current than this little brass, you know, post will, at least my assumption is. And no, the steel isn't the ideal conductor, but like I said, this jumper wire to the back would work just fine. Now, all that's on the other side are two wires that basically go up into this transformer down here. So this is really just a terminal block to make it easier to hook up. I totally could have just put the power input on the backside here and hooked it up that way, uh, but you would have to unbolt this board like I did in order to change it out. So I'll leave it the way it's set up, but at least I made these little jumpers to make it a little bit better than this terminal BS and let's face it this zinc coated steel battery terminal is probably going to be less likely to break off than this little brass thing and like I said it'll have the wire to feed power through so I think it'll be all right you know this uh, is a better setup I think you know who knows all right let me go and start making a power cord 
All right, so <laughs> had to take a pit stop to get more butane. My uh, little torch here ran out, of course, just as I needed it the most. Funny story about that butane I'll share in a second. So anyways, I have the cord approximately cut to length. I put a piece of heat shrink tubing on this. Of course, ran out of butane when I needed it. But I have the two power wires cut to fit properly and then I have the ground cable cut as well to fit on the terminal so that's all good. So now that this is cut properly I'm going to sit here and heat shrink this so I know it's good. Pull it back out. I have replaced this clamp here uh, in order to hold this cord firm into the machine. Now this is 6-3 so it's 6 gauge wire three conductor, even though I don't know why they call it three, because it only has uh, a green, so a ground, and then two hots. Kind of odd that they would call it that, but it is what it is. Or at least that's what Home Depot, I would have thought it would be a six, two. Anyways, it is a high voltage, 600 volt rated extension cord. I'm not going to be running anywhere near 600 volts, so I know it's going to be more than safe. So anyways, funny story about how I had to get this. I went to the local Walgreens. They didn't have any. And then, of course, I went to a couple uh, liquor stores. They didn't have any. And I wound up at the local, no joke, it's literally across the street from where I'm at, adult video store to get this. And I'll tell you what. I don't have much shame to be completely honest with you guys, but getting carded to buy butane in a porn store is quite comical, especially at my age. Not that I'm that old, but I don't belong in a store like that. And to only buy butane, I could have got two for one movies, but nah, I get paid to uh, penetrate in all positions anyway, so what? What do I need that two-for-one videos for, right? So I will show you guys how I do my fittings. Now, I have an actual tool to do these where you hammer them on, and unfortunately, I do not know where that is, and it's in a bin somewhere that I don't care to find at this moment. And what you would normally do is you slip it in and you hammer the top, and it has like a... Uh, pin and a anvil to crimp this but what we're going to do is we're just going to smash it in the vise and then we're going to solder it together so that wouldn't come off on its own but I'm still going to solder it on I'm going to heat this up for quite a while on both sides, try not to melt the wire, the jacket at all. Once it gets hot enough, the solder will kind of flow into there, like it's kind of balling up there. It will eventually flow through capillary action. Come on, buddy, heat up. There it goes, it's going in there. And that's stuck good enough for me. Let that cool off for a second, switch and do this guy. Realistically, this one was such a tight fit that there isn't going to be that much solder that found its way in, but just enough to where it's going to help stick that, the wire to the terminal end. All right, and that is solid now. All right, so those studs that I bought for this will work out great, and the original nuts that held everything on will still work so I kind of lucked out on there
Now, because this is a 240 volt device, it doesn't matter which, now in this case, it's red and black, but since they're both hot leads, as long as they're from opposing sides of the panel, so you actually have 240 volts, you're fine. All right, so I'm not a huge fan. This is an aluminum terminal block, and they have this copper wire originally going into this aluminum. And if you know anything about aluminum and copper, is you can have uh, corrosion present between them due to the dissimilar metals. And we don't want that. So what I did is I got a little copper version of that that should, yep, and it fits that we're going to use this as a grounding lug instead of the crap that was on there, which by the way was factory. And there we go. So everything appears to be out of the way. I will, yeah, this is decently far. What I'm going to do is put these extra nuts on there just to hold it and then I'm gonna grind this down flat all right I'm mostly done with the inside here as you can see everything's wired up nice nothing's touching anything our uh, major problem that with this terminal block that was broken off is fixed and we learned a valuable lesson always check stuff now I clean this out somewhat I'm going to actually clean it out a little bit better with this stuff. It's normally used for electric motors, but it will clean basically lots of stuff in here. Now, I don't want to, and you don't want to, just douche this thing to the point to where it's dripping and all that metal metallic dust finds its way into every nook and cranny on the transformers and all of that. We just want to clean a lot of this filth better out of here and I'm gonna do that off camera in a minute outside because I'll tell you what that stuff if you're not high on life at the start of the job you will be by the end of it so definitely an outside uh, <laughs> job for that so anyways uh, what I will do now is this power cable end because we do not have a plug-in on this yet we're gonna put one on now so let's go and do that so this is kind of self-explanatory, so I didn't really do a how-to on this, but you want to cut your cables to where they fit exactly for length and that you don't have too much hanging out the end for this because, well, if you had wire hanging out from here, it could short out here. Now, some guys will run your ground wire up through the middle and then attach it. I don't like doing that because if this thing gets knocked around a bit, this wire can chafe and get cut open on the edge of this. I rather run it off to the side, tuck it down where it's only touching on plastic, less likely to short out. And with the way that this thing interfaces on there, it should kind of keep this out of the way. And that's my goal anyways. And this strap right here is pinched down extremely tight <clears throat> on this uh, sheathing here. So this is not, I mean, I can yank on this. It's not going anywhere. And it goes without saying is if you notice the rubber sticking out of here and you see the, like this wire and no outer jacket or you think this is slipped, do your due diligence and pull this apart and inspect it. The last thing you want to do is plug this in and get, you know, shocked <laughs> grabbing down here. You know, granted, this is fairly safe, but, you know, if you got some loose wires in here, it's not going to be good, especially, you know, 240 volts, 30 or 50 amps is nothing to play with. You know, it can go south in a hurry. This is set up for a 50 amp plug. It'll also... Uh, plug into a 30. Now I use number six wire, which is perfectly safe to be using on this welder. No, number six isn't really adequate to be getting max power out of this machine, but it's only going to be going on a 30 amp breaker to start with. 
which I'll be able to get maybe 130, 40 amps out of this thing and 50 at most. So this is rated for the plug that's on here, 50 amps. So there's no safety issue there. If some idiot were to direct wire this up to something, you know, like a 90 or 100 amp breaker, that's on them. You know, they'd have to take this 50 amp plug off if you catch my drift. Well, all I really have to do then is bolt this up and call it a day for right now. And we'll go to conclusion. Well, as you can see, I finished cleaning this up, scrubbed it out a little bit more, looking really good. As far as I can tell, everything should be fine now that the power cable is fixed and wires are actually hooked up. So I guess what did we learn today? Well, we learned that old welders probably aren't too safe to plug in if you can't test them and you're always better off opening up something, taking a look in there to see what's going on before you go and try and rely on something like this. Now this particular welder, I'm honestly not too sure of its age. I'm sure I could run the serial number or, or call Miller and they would tell me right away. Judging by the front panel, it said something about 1971. I doubt this is that old, it could be. My guess is more or less the 80s on this one. Who knows though? But from what I can see, it's in good shape. Uh, obviously, cleaning things out and getting the dust knocked off of it is in your best interest. And it really brought this thing back. You know, is all that magnetic grinding dust and welding spatter, all of that, going to cause a short? Well, over time, maybe. But now that it's all cleaned up, it definitely should last quite a long time. I mean, these things are virtually indestructible. And guess what? In part two, when I actually test this, if it doesn't work and there's a problem with the transformer, oh well, you know, we'll end up tearing it apart and probably figuring out what's wrong with it. Likely it's not going to be something easy to fix, but hey, that's the purpose of tearing stuff apart, you know, is you, you can't win all of them. But with that said, thanks for sticking around for the video. In part two of this, which will be out in a little bit, we will actually test all aspects of this uh, to the ability that I can with my 9500 watt generator, which this thing's so power hungry, it's going to be pretty limited. But we'll have some fun with this, and this will be the new shop stick welder, I think, for a while. And I mean, I'm going to keep on a hold of this thing for probably forever because, well, like I said, they pretty much never blow up. So anyways, thanks for sticking around for the video. If you got any comments, questions, thoughts, you know where to leave them.